dollar customers uh, when they in come and check out our product. So we'd love to have Scott here today. Another big theme that we've noticed is people, um, you know, all of their investment money, no matter where they live in the country, always tends to direct towards maybe Boston, a Fidelity, or New York, or where, you know, wherever these big money management companies may be. And we found a lot of our customers feel very empowered to um, you know, make an investment that might impact their community or also make an investment <clears throat> that might be a bit ignored by those markets. So um, I'm loving to hear Scott's experience today and how he invests across the Midwest and you know, the different challenges and also advantages you know, that might, might bring investing in your own kind of backyard in your area that you know, you know well. Awesome, thanks Brendan. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. We're lucky to have Scott here today from Comeback Capital. Um, Scott, why don't you give us a little bit about your background um, and a little bit about Comeback Capital. And after you give your bio, I'll, uh, I'll kick off some questions into the fireside chat. And just one housekeeping note to people, if you do have questions along the way, feel free to either raise your hand, type in the chat, or uh, type in the Q&A, and, and we'll address them as, as we go. But um, here's Scott from Comeback Capital. Well, great. Well, thanks for... Thanks for having me here. So I'll give you a bit of background. Um, I have been a long time angel investor in uh, startup companies. And then in 2017, met a bunch of coastal uh, investors. There was actually a bus tour of uh, top VCs led by two congressmen that were traveling throughout the Midwest. There was about $8 billion of capital under management on this bus tour. And they were looking for a way to invest um, in the Midwest. Um, and I came up with a model for Comeback Capital, which is basically taking angels from across the Midwest, sourcing deals and deploying capital from those coastal investors in a scout fund. And it turns out that we ended up as we did the first fund of Comeback Capital, that there was a second group of investors who were pretty interested in this, which was people who are already located between the coasts in the US who don't have good ways to find opportunities to invest in early stage companies outside of where they are, right? It's very hard if you sit in Chicago to find Pittsburgh startups, particularly at the early stage, because when it's two people in a garage, that's not a stage where the company's really well known. So we have um, are just finishing the deploying of our first fund. We have a second fund that's about to launch uh, in July. And then we also have an accelerator studio um, that is launching uh, also in the, in the third quarter of this year. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about this, but the idea is that we want to get earlier and earlier in the process for these companies. And there's lots of reasons for that in the current markets. Great. Thank you for that overview. So you mentioned the term coastal, um, and I'm assuming that means like the West Coast and East Coast, like San Francisco and Boston dominate the VC or have dominated the venture capital landscape in the past. Is yeah, that so yeah, pretty much. So if you look at the data, right, that if you took the San Francisco Bay Area, so Silicon Valley, San Francisco, add in New York City and Boston, you're at 80% of the venture capital activity. And that That's basically um, has important implications for the rest of the country, because nowhere else has anywhere close to the level of scale that it needs, right? So there's probably a couple good deals in Cleveland, Ohio, where I am every you know, year or so. There's a couple good deals in Pittsburgh. There's a couple good deals in Cincinnati, a couple good deals in Kansas City. But to get anywhere near what you need, you need to aggregate and respond to getting a system together or a network together so you could invest throughout that area. And that's in effect what we've done with Comeback Capital is provided a way for people to invest um, everywhere else. The only other model we know of where anybody can do that is to give, um, to invest money in Steve Case's uh, fund uh, and, and do it um, that way through their bus tour activities. Those are, the, those are the only mechanisms that we've seen for aggregating. Gotcha. Um, so you go on this bus ride, you get the idea, now you've got the coast looking at comeback. W what are some of the other like 
unfair advantages of the Midwest? You know, being the first in with Steve's fund, like what gives you the ability? I mean, at the end of the day, you're looking to like outperform other asset classes like the stock market or the bond market. What what gives a Midwestern VC like an unfair advantage for being like an early entrant in, in the Midwest venture capital scene? Okay, so I'm going to divide the answer to that into two parts. The first part is like, why be in the asset class, right? And then the second part is, why be in the asset class in, you know, in companies in the heartland? So the first part about the asset class is there's there's two things that are, are, are really important, that the um, ability to get extraordinary outside returns um, are not really possible in most of the other you know, asset classes because the idea that one could 100x one's money is not even, even if you got the right, I suppose if you get the right hour on GameStop, right, you could take advantage of that craziness, but, the, but it's very hard to get this kind of 100x returns that are based in some economic fundamentals, like somebody solved an actual problem and there's economic value there as well as the ability to generate the um, financial returns. And then if you do that at scale and you do about 100 or so companies, you basically can drive very high returns at relatively low risk because of the, you know, of the diversification, right? So, so the, that's a, one reason to be in the asset class. The second reason to be in the asset class, which is an increasing reason, is the, um, uh, the, um, the QSBS, that fi five-year holdings of these companies, if the fund is relatively small and you're making those investments, are capital gains tax-free, which is actually looking like it's going to be a more important advantage in the next few years if, as the cap, capital gains tax uh, rises, right, you know, relative. So there's a couple of reasons that you want to be um, in the asset class in terms of getting, you know, the high returns. So why be in the asset class and not just do it in, uh, in San Francisco? A lot of that has to do with the value of being in a thin market. So there's uh, entrepreneurs are much more evenly distributed than the investors in the space, right? So every, you know, there's problems everywhere and entrepreneurs are basically solving some, you know, problem that either consumers or businesses have come up with a novel solution that has value. And, you know, they're, you know, proportionally, um, you know, everywhere. The investors tend to skew towards the pockets of um, the highest level of activity, and that's New York, Boston, and predominantly San Francisco and Silicon Valley. So you get an opportunity where you are investing in a pretty good pool of companies, um, but there aren't a lot of other investors. So you get a lot of very good deals. Um, if, especially if you do this at the early stage, which we do, where um, you know the time that you save entrepreneurs by moving quickly, right, and uh, is of great value to them. You can get the deals at very attractive um, valuations. And and for entrepreneurs at the earliest stages, when there's just a handful of people. If they're busy raising money, they're not busy building the company. And so, you know, you can basically say, hey, we're going to get this done in a couple of weeks um, and take a lot of the friction out of the fundraising. And then um, in return, drive a lower valuation, which then as the company develops um, and raises more money and grows um, and the value is created, you get a, a significant markup. Got it. That's a great, great answer. Yeah, Brandon, go ahead. My, I just want to share, you know, Henry, our CEO, you know, his experience, even in Austin, which people think, hey, this is this booming city. You know, there's a few VC funds here, but Henry was on flights to San Francisco and New York. And part of that is, you know, we're finance tech specialized. So again, that's where these people are. But what Scott's saying is it doesn't matter, you know, what industry you are, you're often having to fly to these cities. So we lose Henry for weeks at a time as he's going out flight after flight, um, you know, spending company dime to go out there and uh, meet with uh, investors, make sure, you know, for partnerships for the company. But really, he's out there fundraising um, during that point. And I wonder if does Texas qualify as part of the Midwest? We can help Henry stay at home. So this, well, this is interesting, <laughs> right? So when we launched the first fund, which is where, oh, you know, in the next 
you know, couple months, we'll be fully deployed of that fund. We only limited it to 16 states in the Midwest for the next fund that we're launching beginning in July. Um, we defined it differently. We, defi we defined out what it's not. So if companies are exclusively in New York City, exclusively in San Francisco, exclusively in Silicon Valley and exclusively in Boston, that's a no. Um, but if they're anywhere else, or what we're seeing more and more of is these companies that are and, New York City and Kansas City, San Francisco and Indianapolis, because the smart entrepreneurs have figured out that it's kind of crazy to put customer success or your back office in New York City. Like, first of all, you know, people are stressed out and that's probably not where you want customer success, where the, your employees are like hyper stressed and like they're having to talk to the, the customers. Um, but but also the cost structure is much lower in in Columbus. I mean, you know, that like Columbus, Ohio, that's why the banks have back offices in those locations. Yeah, that's very interesting. A lot of money on office space. And, um, you know, Scott, something I've realized that you kind of mentioned, hinted at a little bit with Rocket Dollar customers and just people, there's a lot of value extracted out across the entire, um, you know, private market space now. So in most of the average Rocket Dollar customer, if they're looking at their stocks, they're looking at some alternatives, they look at IPO day, tons of that value has already been extracted well before many different inter intermediaries before getting to the private markets, uh, uh, sorry, the public markets. And, you know, the amount of public stock seems to just keep decreasing or when they finally get to the markets, you know, everyone's been on the party for quite a while now. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the, uh, the numbers, right, I mean, everybody, people are trying to make money, right, buying into something and seeing the rise of that, right, so that you know, sure, you could buy into companies as they go public, right? But somebody else has ridden the value that got to them to the point where they could go public, right? And then um, when the company is public, right, it's possible that there's, you know, upside value in Apple today, right? But probably, um, you know, the big rise in the value of Apple has occurred in its past, right? Uh, you know, um, there as companies uh, go and um, and grow. So we think there's a lot of value to be um, had early. There's also, you know, I mentioned this before. There's tax advantages as well from that kind of um, kind of early investing. So we we happen to uh, we happen to like the space. There's an information advantage as well that I would have to add, right? It's, you know, if you have knowledge of something where a person's really solving a pro problem of customers, you know, um, early on, that, va that information can be worth a, a lot to you. It's very hard to have, you know, a 50% knowledge advantage over somebody else in public markets. Like it just, like maybe you have one one hundredth of 1% these days. Mm -hmm. So you uh, arguably the most value created in Apple was in the garage with two guys named Steve. Um, so early can be subjective. What, what, do, what does comeback define as early? Like when do you wanna start investing in a company? Is it when Steve and Steve meet in the garage for the first time or is it a little later than that? So we have, we have, we think about this with different vehicles, right? So the comeback capital fund is looking at companies where they're probably, they've got revenue, they're probably a year to a two years old, you know, maybe they've got, if they're a you know, B2B company, they've got 10 to $15,000 a month in revenue. And, you know, they've got a handful of, uh, of customers. Um, we also have this accelerator studio model where it's finding people who want to create and solve a problem. And, the trade-off that we're talking about is how do you get the attractive valuation when you invest the, in that company um, for what you're doing? So we think that you can't really write a check without being an accelerator and helping participate in growing the company 
um, on, and, and you know, get the, the value to work at the super early stage, but you can do it at that sort of pre-seed um, small round stage. Now, I will tell you where we don't go later is that we think that the big value comes in investing in sub-million dollar rounds of companies when they have that um, 10 to $40,000 a month revenue and they're still proving themselves out because that's where the founders will take the trade-off of speed for the valuation. And by us saying, we've seen this pattern before, we know what a good team looks like, we know what a good opportunity looks like, and we know how to assemble the investors for the round, that's, you know, that's the, that's the sweet spot for us. Very cool. Yeah, it's, I think it's good to point out to the audience that like an investor in a venture capital fund may differ from an adventure, like an investor in this um, specific venture capital fund. Maybe you could go just a little more into or give an example of how that your LPs in the fund being coastal as well as you have LPs in the Midwest, but how you look to leverage that to help the company, that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So I, the typical situation when you're in a venture capital fund is, first of all, it's actually very hard to get into a typical venture capital fund unless you're deploying a lot of money. Because if somebody's got a hundred or two hundred million or five hundred million dollar fund, they have a limited number of investors they could have, and you know you got to be putting in tens of millions in many cases to be in the fund, right? Um, but but. But the other part that's important is that we are operating on a model where we want to have active investors, not the passive investors who are typically in a venture fund. So what that means is we are deploying some of the capital that the investors invest with us as our limited partners. And that um, ability for us to generate the carry on that is the incentive to find the deals and vet them and go through uh, you know, this effort. Now, to just give you an order of magnitude, in three years, we looked at 4,500 companies to invest in 24. Right, so there's a there's a lot of like you know finding the tail of the distribution here that we're gonna gonna do. But then when that happens and we invest we urge our investors, our LPs to sidecar, to invest alongside of us in those companies. And that's what makes us very different than most early, most um, venture funds and um, where we're operating a different model. So our belief is that somebody who might be the CTO of a company that has become very successful in say, and gone public or got acquired for a couple billion dollars in, the Midwest, that person as our LP has a lot to say to somebody who is starting out in, the, you know, with a soft, say a software company in that industry and building that relationship and getting them to advise the company is valuable. At the same way, it's very valuable to get a partner in a firm like um, SoftBank or Bloomberg Beta who are, you know, LPs in our fund to um, build a relationship with that company because they are they have access to a lot more money and they have better relationships than um, than we do in many cases and so that's what we're trying to encourage. We think there's a lot of value in the network. I think is the simple way of saying it. Yeah, I mean, it sounds really like saying that the the job, the work that you're doing, really starts when you write the check. That's like the the starting point, you're going to then get your hands dirty, roll up your sleeves and assemble the right LPs to help mentor the startups to give them more bang for the buck. Is that accurate? Well, yeah, except that we're doing an awful lot of work to find which ones are worth uh, worth doing that with, uh, you know, on the front end. But, but you know, I would say this, the, the, the model is not all that different than what people have done for years with angel groups, except that we act quickly and most angel groups are slow and we are a much broader geography. There's just no way you're in an angel group in Indianapolis, Indiana, right? I don't care how great you are as that angel group. 
there's just not enough deal flow in Indianapolis for you to be super successful the way that Sequoia could be super successful. It's just never going to, you're never going to see the volume. There's just only so many people in Indianapolis starting high growth companies. Yeah. And then, so you've got the whole, the whole scope of the, those 16 state radius that you mentioned where, um, you know, two of them are in Indianapolis, two of them are in Cleveland and you're, beating yourselves up to find all the opportunities in that wider geography. That, that makes sense. Um, how, and I'll get to Robert's question in a second. I just wanted, you mentioned, you know, having that coastal connections. When you invest, are you just writing a check early and, you know, and quickly, or do you follow on? Meaning when the company grows or has some accelerated growth from your early check that comes in fast, are you then following on in the next the next time the, the the startup goes out to raise more money in the next round, or is that where you pass it off to your coastal partners for that have access to more capital? So we have a particular philosophy here where the comeback capital fund doesn't follow on. We give our pro rata rights to our LPs, so our LPs can. Um, uh, have that opportunity to follow on if they choose to do so. Now, in practice, what happens is people who chose to make a sidecar investment in a given company will tend to be the ones that want the pro rata rights because nobody really wants the pro rata rights for something they didn't do before. That Cognitively, it's pretty hard to wrap your head around uh, like, I, I didn't care about this company before. I didn't really pay a lot of attention. The only thing I've really done is seen, you know, the updates that came through, you know, Scott on this, and now there's an opportunity to invest again. I mean, we've had one instance where somebody had interest, but most of the time it's the people who made the investment that then, you know, do the follow on. Got it. Um, so we do have a question here from Robert. It says, please, speak to the advantage of this model, like the venture model that you're talking about, over existing opportunities in the digital asset world where 100x gains are often simply a Tuesday afternoon. Um, ironically, it is Tuesday afternoon right now. <laughs> um, the public can enter a Series A round on bank to the future at pre-money valuations of less than 150 million. This can all be fee free until a back end 5% exit fee. I don't see the advantage of participating in a fund when it could be done individually without the frictional fees, question mark. Um, I don't know what the specific question is. There's a question mark at the end of the statement, but is it how, what is the value proposition for venture versus, you know, these gains are seen in digital assets, or is that something you're even looking at? And, you know, I'm kind of rephrasing the question here. I have one thing I think the question is asking, and then Scott yeah. can take this one. Uh, so I, if you want to compare this to digital asset space, I say Scott is playing the altcoin market, and he's managing that risk. Uh, when Rocket Dollar customers call, you know, there's the main coins in crypto where people trade all the time, higher volume, and there's a lot of ignored coins. And let me tell you, every single Rocket Dollar customer has one altcoin, or maybe this is an angel investor in Scott's world that comes up and they think this is the next hot startup. When that phone rings at Rocket Dollar, barely anyone ever mentions the same altcoin ever. It's a different single one every single time. I never hear about it again. And then the next 10 investors talk about 10 different altcoins and it's never mentioned of again. So what Scott's doing is often, you know, this information of doing this stuff every day, there are so many startups, you can send a check to somebody. Um, when you're paying for management, you know, like I, for, for example, I don't have time to trade the crypto markets every day. I have to talk to rock dollar customers. Scott's firm is kind of management. You know, if you have the time to manage stuff on your own, whether that be crypto or angel investing, go ahead, go do it. You need to, you'll, you'll be able to have that time to do that due diligence research. For a lot of people, they just don't have the time. Uh, and that's where the fee really comes in, you know, as financial fees have compressed down. It's people trading fees for time and, you know, spectacular research. So I think, does that frame it well for you, Scott? Yeah. yeah I mean, you know, the way I look at it is, look, I mean, number one, um, it's really hard to know about opportunities that exist everywhere at the earliest stage, right? So many of these companies are at the stage well before, um, you know, the companies would be 
even uh, on most of the platforms. Now, the, the other way you could get to a bunch of different companies is you could invest in just the accelerator companies by investing in the fund for tech stars, the fund for Y Combinator, the fund for generator, et cetera. But there's a lot of good opportunities that don't actually go through the accelerators. How do you know that they exist? So what, one of the things that we're doing is saying, look, there's 4,500 early stage companies that we you know, looked at in the past you know, um, 30 months, right? Um, to get down to a list that is, you know, curated for people to have as an opportunity. Um, those companies are located a lot of different places. If you can find them, that's the first part. It's really hard to find them, right? And, and the second part that's really difficult is it takes a lot of effort to screen and go through them. Um, the, the third part is that you're going to take a lot of risk if you're doing what Brendan was describing with this. Um, you know, I'm going to pick one because it's like the altcoins, right? Like everybody has one and it's like, that one's the one, but no two people seem to have the same one. That's the one The the next Uber will be this. I can't tell me how many times a day people tell me this is the next Uber. This is the next Google. This, this is the next Facebook. And yet, the no two people tell me it's the same one in that, you know, in that week. Right. And so um, how do you do it? It's just really um, difficult. The answer to me is if you have a hundred that meet a rough profile of what has potential to be the unicorn within that hundred, you'll have a couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, it was a great, a great uh, dialogue there. Brendan, I thought you're, your answer was spot on. You know, it, venture capital or any active management of an asset class isn't for everyone. If you can, um, if you have the time and the risk management skills and the discipline to, to adhere to that and the ability to adapt, why why would you pay an outside manager? I thought that was a, a good way to put it, Brendan. Um, <clears throat> back to uh, the, the Midwest and the venture, you know, when I think of coastal VCs again, you know, San Francisco has become you know, big data, big tech. And when I think of New York and Boston, I think of like finance, both B2C and, you know, more of the big institutional B2B. Can you tell us what you see in the Midwest, Scott? Is it, I would imagine there's a different scope on the types of types of industry that you're seeing these startups in, or is it, is it kind of like, pockets where you see, you know, some in Wisconsin, some in Minnesota, or is it, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what the different scopes are. Yeah. So, I mean, in different locations, we see a lot of different, um, you know, different kinds of stuff. So for example, in the like Southern Ohio, kind of Northern Kentucky area, there's a ton of logistics and supply chain software stuff that gets started, you know, with the um, hubs that exist in, you know, you know, around the Cincinnati airport and things like that, right? So that there's a pockets there um, at, uh, for one thing. Where, where there are a lot of hospitals, there's a lot of software to make, try to make, frankly, the these healthcare organizations be efficient and frank, and the insurance system to be something that resembles even close to efficient um, there. So there's a lot on, on that. We see a ton of things related to um, trucking and shipping because the hubs for that activity are places like, you know, Chicago and Des Moines and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, the software that deals with what happens when, you know, the delivery was rejected for the truck and the truck needs refrigerated warehousing that's nearby, right? That kind of stuff is not a, um, it's not a New York City problem. We have a company in our early portfolio that's, you know, Path ro uh, Robotics, and they do software that controls the robotic arms for welding. Now, the joke I always said was that they're, they started in Cleveland, they moved to Columbus, Ohio, right, um, when they got funded by, by Drive Capital in a later round. But the joke that I always said in the beginning was the, the 
early San Francisco investors who went in alongside of us investing in that company didn't want to move it to San Francisco because the only people who weld metal in San Francisco are artists, right? Cars, things made of metal are made in places like Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan. Um, so that, the, that that's the kind of stuff you see. Tons of manufacturing tech, like people still walk around factories with this thing called a pencil and this <laughs> clipboard with paper on it to take readings. Like that stuff is getting automated. And those, those are, you know, great opportunities as well. We don't see a lot of like, you know, consumer internet stuff because that's not, tends, that tends to not be in the heartland. Got it. No, it's it's really interesting to hear, you know, the different stuff that you see, um, you know, and I've had the um, advantage, so to speak, of being able to work with you guys. And I, I met you um, a few years back when you guys hosted the uh, the the Comeback Capital Bull event in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, how that has helped scope you know your relationships with the different accelerators and the different you know politicians and the different people and maybe talk a little about that event just so the the audience that you know can can hear about what you guys did in Youngstown a couple of years ago yeah so so like many people right we had an annual conference where we brought all kinds of startups all kinds of uh investors and speakers together we did it First year we did it in in Youngstown, Ohio. The second year we were gonna, you know, we were gonna do it actually in Akron, Ohio, and that was in May of 2020. And when it was scheduled, and as everybody, you know, obviously knows, like no one was doing in person events. So we shifted to doing a a kind of virtual model where what we do is we run events about eight. Um, eight times a year where we do a piece of content and um, uh, followed by a pitch event. And what we do is focus on a given community, take like five or six startups from say, we did Pittsburgh, we've done Columbus, Ohio, we've done Cleveland, where the startups pitch, and then we have them pitch to a group of coastal VCs that we have. And one of the things that we're trying to do is not just share the content about, you know, information, but build those um, relationships. The reality is that big money still resides in New York City and San Francisco. And we've got to, if you want to help build your a portfolio of companies and make those companies in the heartland successful, eventually they're going to need the money from those places where a lot of money resides, right? And that's, that's what we're doing. I use an analogy a lot where I say that I'm, um, I'm a first grade teacher. So I think of people who run these accelerators as the kindergarten teacher. So I'm the first grade teacher. My job is to get the kid into second grade, not into college, right? So I'm not going to do anything on the SPAC that they're going to do, right? Like that's like several grades beyond me. I need to get them from the pre-seed round where we've gotten these different um, early stage investors get that company to get to a next round of investors where there's a markup and um, a good position for my LPs in that company. And then those next investors are going to carry them down the road, like in a relay race to the series B folks, to the, you know, series C, series D, and then eventually to the, to the exit. Yeah. Um, no, that's good. I like the analogy, especially because you do, you know, have the, the background in, in education, being a professor at Case Western, not not a first grade teacher, but an actual professor at a, at a college. Um, how much does that help or like give credibility to the fund? Is there any um, anything that helps is like an unfair advantage or that helps you create alpha for the companies being, you know, we, with your role with Case Western? Well, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. And first of all, I'm not entirely sure that being first grade teacher or teaching in college is all that different, but we'll <laughs> leave that aside for, 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 for other discussions. But um, there's a couple of things that happen. I mean, I actually spent a lot of years doing a lot of research on many of these kinds of questions, the questions that we see. So for example, a lot of investors believe that following on 
when you're doing, when a company raises money for a series A round is a good idea if you're a series seed. I've actually done a bunch of research on this question. And I think it's like the problem of the hot hand in basketball that people believe it to be true, but it's not necessarily statistically accurate. And the argument that I give you about why the data doesn't show that you should follow on is this. I go and find a bunch of companies and look at them and there's some sort of um, initial bet that's going on where you believe that the company will be successful. Other people aren't competing with you for that deal. It's unknown, you get it at a good price. Then you go on to the next round, the companies that are raising at high valuations or because everybody believes it's the hot new thing, they've all systematically overbid, right, for that next round. And then it tends to be priced too high at the next round, and they'll, you see some sort of reversion at the third round, right, um, uh, in, in, in that process. And so one of the things that helps with that, the academic side is, um, is simply thinking about how you manage venture funds in ways that the research shows that you should do it. Second thing is, I actually can see early, really early companies at relatively low opportunity costs. Some of our best companies, we saw at these like little university competitions, right? Where we go to them because that's the, you know, we're doing it anyway, and then you find a company there, right? It, the, when the companies do the Polsky competition at the University of Chicago, they don't look like when the point that Grubhub looked like at the exit, right? They looked like somebody who doesn't quite know what they're doing at that point. And if you, you see it, you get a lot of advantage. That I think is, is the second big advantage that we get because it's hard to do things when the opportunity cost on your time is high. Yeah. You, you mentioned earlier that, and I just want to clarify that there's a bunch of money on the coast. Um, just to clarify, I mean, there's a bunch of money in the Midwest. Like if you look at the major universities here, the, the large amount of, you know, Fortune 500 companies in the Midwest, um, even like startups that have had exits, you know, there's some in Chicago, like uh, Tasty Trade comes to mind. They just had a billion dollar exit. So there's money in the Midwest. Did you mean more like more VC matured money than in the Midwest? Yeah. So I mean, money in an organized um, fashion for the investment in the companies, right? So you take a company, um, I, you know, you can get um, 500,000 or a million dollars into a company pretty much in any community, right? There's enough money around that you can do that. But when you talk about a company raising 40 or $50 million, um, there are relatively few family offices that are directly writing 10 and $20 million checks into companies. It's gotta be a really big family office, right? And then the, the, the second thing is these, um, so the, the, the people who have exited, they tend to be investing in um, uh, some sort of venture fund uh, or are writing, you know, personal checks in the hundreds of thousands of dollars max into a company. So that's the difference. So almost all organized venture capital dollars are in New York and in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Very good. And look, Brendan, there's a question yeah. for you in the chat. And if you want to take a minute after you answer this question, just to kind of inform the audience on what Rocket Dollar does, um, mm -hmm. I think that's helpful because I have a question for Scott as far as what, you know, self-directed IRAs and if he sees that coming into his venture fund, but go ahead and answer yeah. that. Yeah, so I'll start from the startup angle and hit Tony's and then I'll go a little bit into the other assets. So um, Rocket Dollars, you may or may not know, is a self-directed IRA provider. So what we help people do is put an investment inside of a tax advantage IRA. In the startup arena, where this really matters most is um, someone who has the biggest Roth IRA in the country is they saw Yelp very early and they were thinking they're craftier than a lot of their friends. They said, I'm gonna put this Yelp stock inside of an IRA. So if it blows up, like I think it will, 
Um, you know, I have a few other startup stocks in here, but I really think Yelp is going to be strong too. Put them all in an IRA. Yelp blew up and got to protect his tax money inside of a Roth IRA, tax-free after five years. So we have a lot of startup investors. You know, we have traditional IRAs, we have Roth IRAs. A lot of the startup investors, also the crypto investors tend to favor the Roth purely because the, the Roth is more protection if things skyrocket. Um, so uh, we've tried to make that easier, a lot cheaper to do. And like Scott was mentioning some of the tax advantages of these funds. We might see some capital gains tax, some political pressure to push that up. Um, there's just some talk about um, funding the IRS quite a bit more than they have. They've been very overwhelmed um, the last, uh, you know, probably decade. Um, so we might see some more pressure on just private investments, um, whether um, the crypto arena, different assets, taxation in general. Um, and Rocket Dollar helps you pr uh, protect from that by tax planning it inside of a uh, Roth IRA or traditional IRA. And one big thing to consider, a lot of people ask this because they, they, unlike that Yelp person, they don't plan ahead. They see their stock blowing up and they go, oh, this is going to be huge. How do I get this into, uh, you know, they're like Scott saying, they're in the third round. They see things going up again. How do I get this inside of an IRA? By that point, it is already too late. Uh, you have to buy startup stock in an IRA from the very beginning because you cannot sell to yourself and your IRA. You can go back to the same company and say, hey, I'd like to buy more stock. But what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to buy it at market rates, which by the third, fourth, you know, pre-IPO-ish round, you're stuck at those higher rates. Whereas, you know, it's obviously it's a retirement account, so you don't want to be throwing a ton of stuff in. An, um, you want to make sure you spread out your risk in a retirement account. But if you throw just a little bit of startup stock in an IRA and it blows up, you'll be tax protected. Um, so Tony had a question, you know, is... Are rocket dollar investments, um, you know, geographically centered or dispersed across the U.S.? Uh, in startups, usually people calling will call about their friend's VC fund or an angel group. Um, obviously, as Scott saying, a lot of those groups tend to be located on the coast. I get a lot of calls from California, New York, Washington, D.C., um, you know, Philly. Uh, but when angel groups, it's definitely a bit more localized across the United States. So I'd say the VC groups coast. Angel groups dispersed across the United States um, with other assets like real estate or private company investments. We also get a lot of rural investors as well. So Scott's mentioning metalwork, logistics, trucking, things that someone in you know Chicago thinks about logistics. Some cities in the Midwest think about logistics, but Washington, D.C. and um, New York never think about this kind of stuff. So we get people investing in farming, farm technology, logistics technology, something that they see down the street happening um, that they're like, no one's looking at this. I know this business really well. My buddy's got a really strong business. So they feel really nice pumping that money into um, a local business. All right, and then you had a question for Scott, Mike. Yeah, I was fascinated because you brought up agriculture and it kind of changed my train of thought there. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering on the, on the comeback trail when you're out there looking for companies, are you seeing ag tech, like stuff that influences agriculture in, in, that, in that industry? Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll come to that in a second because I do want to yeah. follow up on this the, the IRA stuff because we see a lot, lot of people right increasingly more and more of the um, LPs in in the fund are doing this through their IRA right either the Roth or or an IRA. And part of it is that you can invest um, pretty just as easily into the comeback capital fund, right, through the self-directed IRA as you can, you know, directly make the investment. The second thing that, that people do is that when they then sidecar, that's when they're doing that also out of the IRA. Now, the really sophisticated ones, which are mostly like the people who have been in private equity and made a lot of money, they and Often those are the very people who actually are not planning to use this money themselves. They're planning to give it, uh, you know, to their kids, right? So, so there's three things that are going on mentally there. Number one is 
if I invest in the fund, the fund itself is diversified, right? So I'm not so concentrated. The second is when I think there's a chance for something to really blow up, I've got it inside that that IRA. The third thing is that if this is the money that I'm never going to use, right? And so what I'm trying to do is do this in a way that um, I'm going to pass it on, right? I, I don't have... I'm not worried about the liquidity. I'm not worried that the horizon I can't get, I can't figure out if this is going to turn into a, you know, from a million to a billion dollars inside of 10 years or 14 years, right? It doesn't matter because my horizon is pretty much, you know, undetermined there. We're getting more and more people doing that. So I think that, I, and I believe that's a general trend. And when I talk to other people running other funds, they're seeing more and more and more of this kind of stuff, right? Um, on the, uh, you know, on the terms of the technologies, ag tech is a big thing. It's interesting, right? Like where, where is that located? There's a lot of it. We see it in Iowa. We see a lot of stuff um, in Wisconsin that relates to that. It's kind of interesting, actually, to see that you get um, um, a lot of people going to Brendan's point about the expertise. You'll get people who actually made a lot of money in like dairy farming seeing, oh, wait, what somebody's got in Nebraska seems like a really good technology for some other aspect of agriculture because they see the parallel because they actually understand how we get, you know, food into the, the system. Like, I mean, I grew up in New York City and like food was, it, it seemed to have spontaneously generated in the supermarket, right? There was no, where did it come from? It was there in the supermarket. Nobody knew about the way it got to there in the first place. None of the supply chain, none of the logistics, none of the growing, none of the, the tech behind that. Nobody ever cared. It's funny because Yoni is in New York City and he commented too that nobody's thinking of like food tech or ag tech in New York City. Um, Brendan, there's another question for you from Tony. Um, while you're reading it, um, I just wanna, wanted to say, you know, we see, we get a lot of questions from people that are asking what to do with their excess capital in their IRAs or their excess cash in, you know, their more traditional accounts. And I think that's just a, you know, a circumstance of there being no interest rate yield across traditional asset class, like traditional bond classes. And then you know, the stock market's at an all-time high, making less and less sense with higher volatility. So, um, yeah, just wasn't a question, just more of something that we see is a lot of people having excess cash that don't know what to do with it. And, um, you know, this is an exciting opportunity to be, you know, early in a, in a marketplace in the Midwest where venture is just starting to, to grow. So, yeah. I would add one other thing that, I want people to think a little bit also about, it's not just the technology that comes from the geography, but the kind of customers that exist in different places. So we have a company that we invested in, FloatMe, which um, has had really spectacular growth in its first few years of life. I mean, you know, going from like $2,000 a month uh, in revenue to 600,000 in a year is a pretty remarkable pace of growth. And they're in San Antonio, Texas and in um, Cleveland, Ohio, right? But the important part is that their first initial product is a FinTech product that deals with avoiding high overdraft fees. Now, what's important about that? And it's the average American who is going to go and have a copay at the doctor's office for their kid, and that copay is going to cause them to overdraft their account, right? Because like, that's not a problem that, um, let's say, investment bankers generally have, right? And so when that, when you are dealing with the broad spectrum of these other geographies, you're seeing customer problems that are also different. So it's not just on the production side, but on the on the customer side as well. Yep. Yeah, and I, I just typed a response in here for uh, Tony. Basically, we get this question a lot, actually. Uh, I'm an employee of a startup. 
Uh, I'm getting a lot of shares incoming. I believe in my company in the very long term, can I own shares in my IRA or potentially the shares I'm getting from the, uh, you know, the rocket dollars uh, employee stock program? Can I put those in my IRA? And the answer is you have to, again, you have to get different shares. So it can be the same company. Be, but you have to, uh, you cannot take your uh, employee work earn, earn shares and shove them into an IRA. You can go to your boss or go to another employee and say, hey, check the rules, check, check, you know, make, check sure you make sure you don't own too much of the company. But you can go and say, hey, I'd like to buy some of these shares at market rate in my IRA. If, if you're not like a C suite employee, you can usually do that. If you only own a small amount of the company, you're usually allowed to go and buy some in your IRA. Uh, if you're the CEO or, you know, one of the top couple employees that can throw your weight around on the board, sometimes there's some more restrictions there. So I say to, you know, if you really, and this shows if you really do believe in it, um, usually those shares are quite cheap at that moment. So go approach your management, check to make sure you can qualify, buy some at market rate, you know, when the shares are pennies or below a dollar, then you have that a little chunk inside of your IRA and you've done it in an IRS compliant way. Great. And Brendan, there's another question. I think that's probably geared towards Rocket Dollar and you in the in the Q&A there. Um, so I kind of just answered the, the startup option one. Um, I yep. just typed, I typed my answer in there as well. That's okay. Uh, perfect. That's my I answer. Make sure we're being respectful and getting everybody's questions. Um, mm -hmm. And we're getting close to being up on time. So to the oh. attendees, if you have any other questions, feel free to type them in. Scott, uh, maybe you could type your email in if you're open to taking questions from people that may not want to ask it in the in the forum here. Um, you know, and if people are interested in learning more about comeback in general, um, you know, what I one last question that that I'll ask about the fund is: Do you, when you think about comeback and you know what you're doing on this fund, is there like an ideal profile? of a limited partner or an investor in the fund? Do you have like a like an ideal profile of somebody that you'd like to have as an investor? Yeah, I think that the ideal profile is that the person wants to have um, some involvement with startups and do this. This is not, the ideal investor is not a person who's completely um, passive, right? If they're going to be completely passive and not want to have any interaction, they're not going to want a sidecar there, um, th then it's probably not appropriate. But anybody with um, any interest in and knowledge about, you know, companies uh, is really helpful. And by that can be pretty broad, like expertise on HR, expertise on supply chain issues, you know, accounting, it doesn't have to be that you were an entrepreneur, just, you know, um, probably um, a foundation itself, just being a passive investor to try to generate financial returns is not our ideal. Got it. And Brendan, go ahead. Yeah, my, my, I realized I missed one in the Q&A. So uh, Michael asked a question, you know, do you see public and private funds? Um, kind of investing into the same uh, real estate investment, or this could be VC investments. Think of it as just the same alternative investment. Um, you can go into that investment into multiple different ways. However, usually you should stick to being passive. So some people say, I have personal money in this deal. I also want to put retirement money in this deal. Uh, maybe I also work somewhere that you know does some administration. So you should typically, um, if you're investing in something like that, you should probably try and stay passive. Um, if you manage something, you know, let's say you were like uh, Scott saying politicians come and they say, hey, we're doing uh, fundraising for this. We're getting public money into these Midwest VC company funds. If you're someone like that, you should probably stay away from an investment. The IRS is typically they don't like you to be anywhere near the management of the fund or be putting other dollars where you manage the fund, because what they really don't want happening is you to juice up your IRA somewhere. Um, so generally, feel free to do that if you own a small amount. Um, come in from many different angles. Um, you know, approach that from a public or private investment side. If you do do some fund management or you're kind of entangled in that, best to stay away from that type of investment. Great. Thanks, Brendan. I don't see any other questions. We're getting close to the end. Scott, 
Is there anything that we missed that you want to say or add about what you're doing with Comeback Capital? Well, I, I don't think so. Um, although, you know, I don't want to open up the whole big avenue of uh, the government funding of things now. But, you know, we're now about to, we're seeing this um, uh, SSBCI, the State Small Business Credit Initiative, and the feds are um, pumping more money into the venture world through the states than they ever have before. So we're going to see more and more of this stuff over the next couple of years, um, uh, you know, going on. So I think it's really, we're headed into a boom time for uh, investing in early stage companies. Awesome. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today, Scott, and, you know, getting us acclimated with what Comeback's doing and some of the research you've done. Brendan, do you want to mention how people can get a self-directed IRA account? Yeah, so uh, you can always sign up online and you can use the code uh, regiment or rangers for $50 off one of our accounts. And the last thing I forgot to mention, which is really important for startup investing, is we specialize in what's called a checkbook IRA, which is an IRA LLC or a solo 401k. Um, you know, that's a little different than direct custody, which we're also building up that product as well now, but that allows you a lot of freedom to go out to startup investments, especially ones in your area community that some custodian, maybe it's us or someone in New York or your, you know, your custodian does not understand a checkbook IRA allows you as an angel investor to go into a new fund, new venture company. Um, and you don't ever have to have a custodian holding you back. So can you use code regiment or Rangers for $50 off? Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Mike. This was a great conversation today. Yes. Thank you, Brennan. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank All right. You. And thanks, right. everybody, for coming. It was great. And uh, have a great day. Appreciate it. All right. Bye.